There's no such thing as a throwaway child. Children often don't come forward to say, I'm being exploited, I'm being trafficked, because they're afraid. A lot of times the victims don't even see that they're a victim. Be able to track down a trafficker, identify them, find the evidence, build a case, that's a huge part of why we do what we do. Every day, young people in our state are sexually exploited, some as young as eight years old. Rather than judging these victims, we must recognize them as who they are, vulnerable children who need our help. In this video, we'll give you tips on how to identify and communicate with victims and information about immediate resources to keep them safe. The first step is to recognize the victim. When we think about individuals who have um, behaved in ways that are not socially acceptable, we tend to think of them as there's something wrong with them. And what would be helpful is to think of them as what has happened to them. Try to look through that lens when you see a kid in a motel somewhere who's strolling on the street maybe. Um, try to look at, at it through the lens of an abused child because that's what they are. In your work, you are likely to come across sex trafficking victims and not realize it. The key to identifying a victim is to closely observe them. Does she or he avoid eye contact? Is she or he unusually hostile, anxious, or withdrawn? Check for tattoos with the trafficker's name or symbol, as well as bruises, scars, or burn marks. Take a hard look at the people she may be with. Are they significantly older than the possible victim? Does she refer to one of the males as a boyfriend or daddy? See who's holding her ID or other belongings. And listen for sketchy explanations of how they all know one another or inconsistent stories about what's going on. Note how she or he interacts with you. Does she seem guarded or unwilling to talk? Is he giving you unclear responses to basic questions about where he lives, works, or goes to school? Her responses may be vague or sound like she's been coached. She may not even be able to identify her acquaintances. Take the opportunity to ask the possible victim plenty of questions, like where does she live and has anyone hurt her? All kinds of things from whether that person has identification on them, whether that person is free to leave, you know, where they're going. If in a situation she makes or earns any money, does she have access to it? Does she control it? You know, all kinds of things to look at the scope of that relationship and see what's really happening. Sexually exploited youth may enter the healthcare th through the emergency room. And that emergency room visit may be to an overdose. It may be because they drank so much alcohol that they're passed out. It can be because they've had a suicide attempt. It's making sure that when you see these other risk behaviors in the emergency room, that you're asking the question, or are you ever in a position where someone is having sex with you that you didn't want, that you weren't attend intending to? And even going further and saying, have you ever been in a position where you've exchanged sex for a cell phone, for transportation, for housing. Your overall approach is extremely important. Because of the manipulation and trauma she has endured, the victim is likely to be uncooperative. Listen, be respectful, and gain her trust. I think it's important for them to see the victims as truly victims, that they have endured uh, unspeakable acts of, of violence and abuse and that the trauma for them has affected their overall development. And so they fear law enforcement, they fear um, systems professionals because they worry about being arrested, they worry about possibly being deported, or that they would receive uh, some type of um, punishment for what they have done. I'd say the biggest thing to do is believe them, believe them in, that they're a victim and believe what they're saying. I think the second thing to understand too is that they might be in a situation at the time where maybe they reacted right away and kind of said, hey, I need help, but might go back later and renege on what they're saying. So you need to understand that sometimes it will take more than one or two tries for them to kind of escape the situation they're at. And 
For most victims, being identified is only the first step in a very long process. One of the challenges with these cases uh, is that they do take both quite a while to put together to oppose the trafficker, but also takes quite a while for victims to disengage from being with the trafficker. And so these are very difficult cases. They take a while and they require just a lot of, of effort on the part of victims who have to sacrifice a lot of themselves to be able to participate in this. For Caitlin, growing up in northern Wisconsin meant years of finding her own way with little adult guidance. She battled depression, ADD, and drug addiction. In search of a better life, she moved to the Twin Cities at age 18 with no resources. I became a stripper. That's kind of where everything else went downhill from there. Caitlin's life changed rapidly once she moved in with the man who became her trafficker. My intention was never to stay. And then a month later, I found out I was pregnant with his child. And during that time, he had a friend who paid him for me to go out of sex with him. After I had my daughter, everything just got so much worse. He started hitting me more, choking, and then he put me to work again. Putting her to work meant forcing her to get involved with her trafficker's business that had expanded to include his other family members. It was Caitlin's job to place ads online and take care of the kids. At one point, Caitlin called law enforcement and thought her nightmare was over. Her trafficker went to jail temporarily and she found herself alone on the streets with her daughter. Finally, I couldn't, I didn't know how to feed her. I couldn't buy diapers. So I did sign me up. We filled out a temporary custody. We just wrote it out. What transpired next was a nightmare of court battles that ended up in Caitlin losing custody of her child. Then, her trafficker and his relatives were arrested, and Caitlin was contacted by Sergeant Ray Ganey. It was a relief because I had never told anybody my story. And after that, I kept in contact. Um, he helped me try and find where, I, where my daughter was. He gave me numbers to call, and he was just extremely, extremely helpful. Caitlin's testimony against her trafficker's family helped to put them behind bars for some of the longest sex trafficking sentences ever handed down in our state. As for Caitlin, she's close to getting her daughter back, has permanent housing, a new job, and a whole new outlook on life. Proud of myself, got on my feet. I'm not letting him destroy me anymore. I'm worth something. <laughs> Minnesota continues to serve as an example to other states around the country. Our state has a team of systems professionals, including human services, child protection, medical professionals, and law enforcement, that have all united to take on the issues surrounding sex trafficking in our community. Minnesota is the first state to dedicate state resources, state funding, to this problem and to set up a whole system to try to deal with this. Uh, and, and also, I think the fact that we're taking a, a health model and a multidisciplinary model. This is not just something that's for law enforcement or for advocates um, or for any particular group. We're really working all together, and that's a, that's a new thing, uh, and I don't know that any other state is doing that. But we have to work as a team or we will not be successful, and we need to look at how do we educate our children within all of our communities about exploitation, about trafficking, about telling an adult that we will not judge them, we will help them. Some of the biggest improvements we made statewide was uh, the statewide human trafficking task force uh, getting up and running and getting uh, the different uh, professions involved in it. The state of Minnesota made large steps forward in the last handful of years because so many people were involved in it on so many different levels, uh, policymakers. Uh, to help us get some of the laws changed uh, and the sentencing uh, structures changed. Um, um, people training, uh, lodging industry training, the people that work in that area to identify this and, and help law enforcement. Um, those are the things that I think were the biggest steps forward for Minnesota. Minnesota's innovative approach to sex trafficking was cemented with the passage of the Safe Harbor Law. A child who is being trafficked may no longer be arrested or charged with prostitution. Instead, the child is directed to the child protection system. 
I'm feeling very positive about where we're at. I think we've really managed to have a quick and succinct response to um, some of the um, pieces of Safe Harbor, and um, I think it's, it's you know really surprising too, given that this is not just a metro-centered focused approach, but really take into consideration Minnesota as a whole and really kind of make sure that people are connected. Safe Harbor means more than legal changes. The law also established a system of regional navigators in the Department of Health to connect victims with services. And a statewide hotline provides up-to-date information on shelter availability. When encountering a potential victim of sex trafficking, be as thorough as possible. The details you record could make a big difference down the line. Connect victims with services. Regional navigators can help. And report underage victims to child protection. Any child who is being prostituted must be reported, regardless of the identity of the exploiter. When we work with children who have been trafficked and or exploited, we need to really all move at the pace that's best for that child. When we say, oh, I understand, no, if you yourself have not been exploited or trafficked, you don't understand in the way that they understand. So we need to be conscious of that, we need to be respectful of that, and we need to move and proceed and do and what we do honest. in a way that puts that child and his or her needs okay. first and foremost. Those of us on the front lines can identify victims and refer them to services. But victimization can only be prevented when we focus on the demand, those who buy other people for sex. I think we have to start very young to teach boys different things, but men have to step up for that. It can't be just women who are doing this work, as it so often is. I think there are good men who are beginning to lead this fight. It's a social issue. You could talk about societal norms and, and what what should we expect of men and boys uh, and men to teach boys as they grow up about what's what's normal behavior, what's not. I think it's it's going to be a generation before we see some real change in it and in, in the demand side. Our work to communicate with victims, educate others, and assist in building the case against traffickers can be very challenging, but it can also be quite rewarding. The biggest thing um, is the educating your community members, um, educating your professionals in your communities, um, educating yourself. If you have some people in your community that you're suspecting is possibly a victim, you know, either researching it or reaching out to um, a professional in your community, a law enforcement, um, sitting and talking with them and going over the information that makes you believe that this is occurring. That's the, the biggest thing is educating and understanding what trafficking is. If you don't open up the topic, I'm not going to tell you. You might be the one person I could confide in. If I go for a doctor's visit for whatever reason and you ask me, are you okay? You know, we just like to let women know that any kind of abuse is not okay, whether that's domestic violence, sexual assault, prostitution, and we're here to help. It, and you open it up to all women, so you don't feel like, oh, he knows I'm a prostitute. You do, it the, you do the continuum. Once you open that door, you might have someone say, my pimp's out in the, in the lobby, and I don't know what to do, I wanna get away from him. Well, then if you're a professional, you need to know at that moment, you need to have a plan, <laughs> right? Because of the psychological um, distress that they're experiencing and um, the, tr the impact of the trauma on them, they're not going to be very good at raising their hand or saying, hey, I need help in this. And so they need us to really empower them and hold their hands. Because what they've convinced themselves because of the trauma that they've experienced is that they're not worthy of being helped. And so they're going to, to continue to um, not always be open to us because of that, that feeling and because of the trust factor. So we have to work harder. And I feel very proud of the work that's been done in Minnesota around this issue. We can honestly say that we have a statewide collaboration that is committed to the safety of victims. Sex trafficking is an issue that's hidden in plain sight and is a lot more prevalent than people think. It's our job to identify victims, listen to them, and help them get the services they need. Every action we take makes a difference. Nobody should be bought or sold.
Sex trafficking is something that damages you for life. You can heal some of the scars, but they're always there forever. There will always be vulnerable women and children, and there will always be traffickers who are willing to sell those women and children. But until men stop buying, this will never end. And now I'll become a mother, a lover, a friend, a co-worker, and I'm motivated to help bring an end to sex trafficking.